Marco has chosen a 16th century tithe barn set in 300 acres of Sussex countryside for his all-important feast. You're going to love it, Nick, seriously. Today, Marco has brought his maitre d', Nick Mounier, to see it for the first time. She's very impressive. The most impressive barn I've ever seen. And it's been restored beautifully. Amazing, eh? I just, it's a wow factor, isn't it? Wow. I mean, look at that for a visual. I absolutely love it. It was built in 1067. It's very Saxon, though, isn't it? Weren't they the Normans? They were, actually, yes. And where are you at, Nick, today? Up to now, members of the public have had a hand in deciding what goes on Marco's final feast menu. The diners at the yew tree had their tuppence worth. I think that's really important. Maybe I'd have done things a little bit different, but it's, it was the diner's choice. Although he loved their choice of fish pie for a main, Marco was surprised they opted for raw venison tartare as the starter and smoked eel as an appetizer. To avoid any further surprises, Marco has decided to complete the menu himself. I think pudding, I have to step in. Because why should they have total control on everything? That's true. Nick, let's not forget, it is our feast mm. and we are in charge. And I think when it comes to pudding, which is, in my opinion, the high point of yeah. the dinner. Yeah, true. I think we have to start to dictate. That's very exciting, isn't it? Do you have a favourite in there or not? I don't know which pudding I'm going to do yet. These are messy, as visual, in a messy sort of way, but in a nice glass. It's beautiful, isn't it, in that room? I love scribbling. Mm. Accompanied by Mr Ishii, Marco is off to find a pudding. As a child, Puddings always looked so special. You know, your eyes would sort of grow. My dad used to make big egg custards, big trays of bread and butter pudding, big pies. And that's when I think of Britain, I think of puddings. No one makes a pudding like the British. Mr. Ishi, have you ever had creme brulee? Yes, I have. But in England, we call it Cambridge Burnt Cream. And the French call it creme brulee. Marco's en route to Trinity College, Cambridge, who claim the dish was first created there, meaning it would qualify as a British pudding. I never had the academic capacity to get there, Mr. Ishii. So we're going in through the kitchen door, undercover. How exciting is that? Yes. Founded by Henry VIII, Trinity is one of Britain's most spectacular and famous seats of learning. How are you? Very well, thank you. Ian, the catering manager, Trinity College. Lovely to be here. Welcome. And I'm um, looking forward to showing you the creme brulees today. And how often do you make them? Every day. Do you really? We do indeed, yes. Amazing. One of the best-selling dishes on the menu. And can I ask a simple question? Yeah. Did the French steal it from us or did we steal it from them? The French stole it from us. Is that true? Definitely. Okay. It was a Cambridge burnt cream originally. In the early 1700s, it was reported one of the chefs at Trinity College made a, a, a baked custard and burnt it. Yeah, like an egg custard. That's correct, yeah. And um, that was called the Cambridge burnt cream. In the early days, it was stamped with the college crest before serving. In honour of Marco's visit, the college will resurrect this old tradition. What's this? Is here, this the here. brand? This is the brand. It's something we've been developing for some time. It's the cottage crest, which has been embossed onto a uh, alley sheet. It looks like a gimp mask. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't say that, should I, on TV? <laughs> but it is very beautiful. And I, I tell you what I like about it more than anything, the romance. I will never write creme brulee again on my menus. It'll always be Cambridge burnt cream. Delicious. Really delicious. Mm. Very simple. 600 mils of double cream. Bring that to the boil. Five egg yolks. 100 sugar. One and a half in the pods. 
The reason why I use vanilla pods, it's a better flavor. It's the real deal. So the cream's scalded now, we just take it off and we add to our eggs. And there's our custard. Delicious, like a milkshake. Right, just fill the dishes with the custard in the oven, about 110 for 30 minutes. To have a delicate custard flavoured with vanilla with a caramel topping is masterful. I mean, people think it's complicated, but it's not. So there's our Cambridge burnt creams, cooked perfectly. I always say thin layer of sugar, glaze it, thin layer of sugar again, glaze it. Now, we'll do the second coating. If you want creme brulee that much and you want to make it that much, then you should go and buy a blowtorch. Otherwise, don't bother. So, as you can see, very fine. But, you know, it's your choice. You want to put more sugar on, you put more sugar on. Delicious. Marco's great British feast is just around the corner. If the diners walk away feeling that they are truly proud to be British, that I've done my job. He's on the hunt for an all-important pudding to complete his menu. If we're all honest with ourselves, a proper pudding takes us back to our childhood. It reminds us of being young again. Marco's considering serving Cambridge burnt cream, but is keen to explore other traditional puddings before deciding what to serve. Knickerbocker Glory is the first pudding I ever remember eating. So he's come to a famous ice cream parlour in London to relive those early memories. Ciao. Hello, Aldo Marco. How are you? I've come from Knickerbocker Glory. Come to the right place. I remember as a little boy sitting in Notarani's cafe in Bridlington at the table, my mother having her espresso, and me sat on my seat. But the Knickerbocker glory looking me in the eye. Marco's mother, Maria Rosa, died suddenly when he was just six years old. But she's had a profound effect on his culinary career. It's like being that boy of six again. And you know what's amazing? It's almost the same decor. There's only one difference. My mum's not here, but in spirit she is. And what I love about Knickerbocker Glory, the layers. Jelly, ice cream, tinned fruit, it's magical. And you, you eat through the layers. So without realizing it is gastronomy at its best. Flavors, textures, concepts. One of Marco's trademark puddings is eaten mess, and he's been considering it for the feast from the very beginning. My inspiration for the eaten mess that I do came from a Knickerbocker Glory. I took my inspiration from the first Knickerbocker Glory I ever had. Beautiful. So what I'm going to make for you is an eaten mess. And I haven't made meringue for 30 years. Eight egg whites. 400 grams of sugar. At the end, you just put the juice of half a lemon in. Now what I've done is I've got a soft peak. Just put it into the piping bag, but try not to get any air pockets. So when you pipe, you get a nice run. Just put them in the oven, lowest possible temperature, and when they've dried, then they come out and they're perfect. Take the tops off the strawberries. Some raspberries. It's not tradition to put raspberries with eaten mess. But raspberries just give it that little bit of extra richness and that little bit of a punch. A little bit of sugar. The next stage, cream, icing sugar and vanilla powder. Cream. 
double cream, of course. Approx, 500 grams, half a litre. 50 grams of icing sugar, half a vanilla pod. Seeds, vanilla seeds. I should make smaller recipes, it'd be easier. And there's our vanilla cream. So a few strawberries. Okay, then we just break up the meringue. Again, your choice, big or small. And let's live in the real world. If you haven't got time to make meringue, buy it. Go down the supermarket. And then we take a little bit of pulp. So we've got our glasses which we've chilled in the freezer. So when I put the ice cream in, it just doesn't melt. I remember the first time I ever ate Eaton Mess. I did enjoy it, but I thought it was a bit one-dimensional. I think the genius of putting a big ball of vanilla ice cream in the bottom of the dish was from all those years ago in Bridlington, where I first had my Knickerbocker glory. The pulp. Be generous with your pulp. A mess on top, and a nice sprig of mint, and the big bowl for me. <laughs> Marco wants one more pudding option before deciding which to serve at his feast. With the big day approaching, time is of the essence, so he's looking a little closer to home for some fruit for a summer jelly. We like beetroot. That's good value, isn't it? We charge about 12 quid for that in my restaurant. Will you come to buy or come to chat? A bit of come both. Come to do business. That's all right. Your mother's giving me a hard time. Is she? What's she saying now? Oh, she's giving me a hard time. You haven't seen nothing yet. She's going through the menopause like we've got to ignore it. I like your little girl. <laughs> She's nice. Well, she's like a mother, isn't she? Cheeky but nice. <laughs> Summer fruit. That's, that's me. That's my department, Marco. OK. These are nice. Try one. I like red fruits. Yeah, I like raspberries, too. They're nice, aren't are the they? Mm. Nice scent. I prefer those not, to strawberries. Not colour. They need to be left out for a little while yes. in a warm kitchen just to sweeten them. Yeah. That's right, you know. These are good. Sure. You oh, are, nice without there. doubt, the prettiest veg bird in the world. Oh, thank oh, you. Sweet. She is. Seriously, if I live locally, I'd be here every day. <laughs> I'll take this entire <laughs> tray of raspberries. <laughs> I'll take... We'll make lots of portions, so we'll buy that. Right, OK. We'll buy this. Yeah. We need some of these. There, we'll take all those. Mr Ishi, lots of red fruit. There we are. Bye, girls, give me a kiss goodbye. Oh, it's so nice to so meet you, I'm darling. I'm a bit sick now. Do, 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 don't you shave? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm going to prepare now is something very simple. Just red fruits in a rosé jelly. Red currants for garnish, blackberries, strawberries, blueberries and raspberries. Boil our rosé wine. 500 grams of sugar. It may look a little cloudy at this moment in time, but as it boils, it'll boil clear. So it's just going up to the boil now. And what I've got to do is just whisk an eight litres of gelatine which have been soaked in water. You know, you can buy granules, it's the same, whichever your preference is. Just whisk it until it all dissolves. And don't think that your children will get drunk if you give it to them. Because by cooking the wine, you're removing the alcohol from it. And there's our rosé wine jelly. So now we have to let that cool. So a tiny bit of jelly in the bottom of each one. And then what we do... Jelly, fruit, jelly, fruit. So what I don't want to happen is, is I don't want to turn it out and it breaks because there's not enough jelly. And I'm just finishing it off with blackberries. What we do is just put them in the fridge until they've set up. So these jellies have... They've taken about five hours to set. And so what we've got to do is now take them out and then present them. I mean, this is where disaster can strike. Oh, perfect. Jelly Royale. So there's our jellies. What we serve them with is a syrup of raspberries. Flood the plate. I don't like dribbles of sauces on plate. Yeah, I just think it's, what's the point? Does it make it taste any better? And then just some mint. And there's our red fruits in jelly. Marco 
now has three potential puddings and needs to pick one for his feast menu. And whenever there's a decision to be made, he heads to his beloved pub. This time, instead of asking a room full of diners to help him choose, Marco's opted for the safer option, Nick. So, Nick, I think I know what your favourite is before yeah. you end taste Yeah, I know you do. You see, desserts are my... Cambridge burnt cream. Possibly. Is that your favourite? No, well, it's not, actually. What is it? Eat a mess. Eat a mess. But the jelly as well. But I think eat a mess, for me, is the best. Interesting. What I want to do with the pudding is take the diners back to their childhood. Because when we're young, pudding seemed so big, so delicious, so special. That's Beautiful. a big jelly. Yeah. That's for two. No mold. She's just massive. Well, that's enormous. <laughs> Need a forklift truck for that. That's horrific. Jesus. Okay, thank you, Neil. Gorgeous. Mm. The thing is, it's very refreshing, isn't it? Is it going to be that size, boss? Do you think it's big enough? I think it's very big. That's gorgeous. Gorgeous. Very which, light. Which do you prefer, the mess or...? Mm. Look at that. I'd prefer the mess. Like, I would only need a little bit of that. After a big meal. Do you like jelly? The red fruit jelly is delicious. Mm. I do like jelly, I have to say. Because that's more refreshing than your mess. It would be, yeah. It would so be. So you're saying you prefer the jelly than the eaten? If I was drinking wine, then the jelly, definitely. It's gorgeous. Is that nice? Mm. Gorgeous. gorgeous. Sugar. Sugar rush. With no clear favourite, it's down to Marco to be decisive. I don't know. Creme brulee. What do you think we should serve? Uh, it's, a, it's a hard one. Well, why don't we just serve all of them? I think that would be a great idea. Just yeah, pass it down the middle of the plate. Could you imagine that would be brilliant? And then everyone just scoops off themselves, family style. That'd be beautiful. Yeah. Just give them a big spoon. Yeah, brilliant. Let them do it themselves. Make your life easier. Oh, fantastic. Just drop them in the middle of the table. And simple. Having bitten the bullet and added three puddings, Marco's menu for the feast is finally complete. And how easy would that be for you, though? Well, you do one nice size jelly, say four portions. Yeah. You do one nice size creme brulee. You do one nice, you know, you do... That's a good idea, to mess. Because that would be enough for four people, wouldn't it? Yeah, as a taster. Yeah, it'd be perfect. Do you have to burp? Sorry, that was the, the beautiful jelly going Is that down. the beer? No, no, it's the, it's the jelly, boss. After eight months on the road, and with not one but three puddings on the menu, Marco's finally ready for his feast. We have all the pieces to the jigsaw, and they're now all slotting into place. The last piece of that jigsaw was the pudding. But his journey isn't quite over yet. Stunning, isn't it? You should put your boots on, Nick. I know. Well, the ground is pretty hard, boss. <laughs> <laughs> what feast is complete without wine? The problem for Marco is he's hosting a British feast. Terrible, hang on. Look at them. I'll do my bicycle trick. I first tasted British wines. 20 years ago, and I wasn't very impressed with them. Have you walked around an English vineyard before? No, first time ever, do you know that? And I'm really nice, very it? impressed, it's beautiful. Over the last few months, I've spoken to one or two of my friends in the same market. Some of them are okay now, they're quite good. You'll be shocked. Glorious. Determined to give British wines a fair crack, he's brought Nick to the Chiltern Valley Vineyard in Oxfordshire to see if there are any wines good enough to serve at the feast. It wouldn't be a British feast without British wine. And if I can't find a wine that's good enough, then they'll be having cider and beer. Nick Berger is the wine manager, 
and he has a sparkling English wine that he believes could rival the best champagne. People on the whole have a very poor opinion of English wines. I think that what we're trying to do here is to show that English wine making is some of the best in the world now. Thank you, sir. Mark, would you like a glass? I'd like not quite so much. Moose. Would you like that, Nick? Lovely moose, isn't it? This shows a good quality, doesn't it? The moose mm. and the bubbles. Thank you. Beautiful. That is glorious. And I think to sit under a tree in the English countryside, mm. drinking English sparkling is quite delicious. What do you think? Very impressive, actually. Beautiful. Yeah, I think, mm, for the course. start, I think people will be very impressed with that. I mean, I think people will be shocked it's English. Yes. Actually, I think that's the truth. Surprised by what he's discovered, Marco's keen to try another. This is again a blend, Madeleine Angevin Reichensteiner, and it's. Like it's, it's more flavour in this one. Mm -hmm. I could do a glass of that. Mm, definitely. With my fish pie. Mm. It's good, isn't it? Mm. It's easy drinking. Mm -hmm. Very easy. Especially if you're not paying for it. Especially if you're not paying for it, exactly. Oh, you'll be gargling, you'll won't be... you? <laughs> What's the rosé like? It's the rosé that Marco's really come to see, as it's a key ingredient in his the, jelly uh, for the feast. The jelly has caused me complication, because I always make the red fruit jelly with the rosé wine from my mother's village. I'd like your opinion on this, Nate. I can't use the wine from my mother's village, because it's not British. So I've had to find an English rosé, and that's not easy. Well, the colour's amazing, isn't it? Mm. That's going to go great with the jelly of red fruits, isn't it? Look at that, boss. Wow. I've never tasted rosé like that before. I don't like it. Yeah, because it's earthy. It's not to my liking. It's quite, um, is it earthy? Not sweet enough. <clears throat> Marco's not keen, but determined that his dishes will be all British. If he can't drink it, at least he can cook with it. But for dessert, it might just do the trick to prepare your jelly. Yes, yeah, because you put sugar in, you see, yeah. Mm -hmm. The sweetness of the jelly. But I'll still go with it, because I think for the jelly with the sugar, mm. I think it'll be good. I think so. It's been a successful trip. Marco's jelly is now 100% British, and the diners at his feast will have more than just beer or cider to drink. OK, it's so the Great British Feast. Marco, cheers. James, cheers. After months on the road, the climax of Marco's culinary journey is just 24 hours away. We've travelled every corner of Britain. We've met lots of individuals seen lots of produce. And if we don't get it right on the day, then it was a pointless exercise. In this ancient barn in rural Sussex, Marco will host his British feast for 220 diners. See, I think that's a good size, man. So when they pick it out, they get a real piece of fish. Does that make sense? Yes. I never get nervous. I leave that to the people around me. One person with a lot of responsibility on his shoulders is Nick Mounier, who will take charge of a team of 32 waiting staff. There's always an element of fear because anything could happen, you know? Um, yeah, but that's what, what happens. You've got to be organised. That's the, the key. And if you're not organised, you'll go down. Marco and his kitchen team are all set for the big day tomorrow, so have left Nick to it. Well, I, th I think what's interesting is realisation has dawned on Nick. Yeah. When he turns down a pint, you know he's on the road. Oh, he's turned it down, he's too busy. To create a real sense of occasion, Marco wants butler service, where each diner serves themselves at the table from a shared platter. Nick's going to have it tough, because he's got butler service. Mm. Yeah. So he's got to put down 220 plates yeah. every time and then bring out the food, and in their own time, they're going to serve themselves. And I think, I, think, I think Nick will struggle tomorrow. I think he'll be in trouble. 
The last time Nick supervised a butler service was over 20 years ago at a state banquet for Margaret Thatcher. I'm just hoping that the service lives up to the food element, so uh, that would be my main concern. We have to deliver. That's the bottom line. We have no option. Tens of thousands of people applied for a place at Marco's feast. Now a lucky couple of hundred have the chance to sample his completed all-British menu. It's very pretty with the herbs. It works very well. Everything seems under control, but you know, Every hour we advance towards the feast, the pressure will increase. It always happens. People's nerves start to wobble. It's very nice I could have dinner in here. It's beautiful. The calm before the storm. A fish pie is a fish pie. What I'd like to think is that we can give them the best fish pie they've ever had. When we give them a Cambridge burnt cream, it's the best they've ever had. A jelly, the best they've ever had. An eat a mess, the best they've ever had. That's what we're trying to do. Okay, cooking for four people is easy. Cooking for 220 is not easy. It's time to get a walk. That's the reality. If you're gonna lead the troops, you've gotta lead them from the front. And you've gotta look like that warrior. You've gotta be brave. Because to do what we're doing today, you have to be brave. You can't bottle it. Marco and his chefs are working flat out to get everything ready in time. For Nick, with 32 waiting staff to brief, time is fast running out. Oh, for fuck's sake. Over here, please. OK, you all fit in? My God, there's loads of you. It's good. OK, guys, good afternoon. How are you all? Thank you for coming. So, obviously, this is the big feast day for Marco. Expectations are huge. The first course will be smoked eel with new potato salad. Once everybody's happy to go, we'll then line up in the kitchen and then Marco will say, go, go, go. Do not go until he says go, OK? If there's any complaints from any customers, please come and see myself. Don't go in yourselves, because he won't, he won't even acknowledge you, all right? Even though he's a nice man, but when he's in his own and he's busy, he won't talk to you. I'm daunted by the fact that, you know, there's a lot of people coming in. You want to do it the best to your ability. I've got a completely new team that I've never worked with before. It's daunted because obviously you want to do your best for Mark and the boys, you know, because there's always that sort of friction between the front and the back. Um, and if I don't do a good job, they're going to blame me for the, you know, for the, the way the food came out. It didn't go quick enough. Nick, Nicola, how many sauce boats have you got for me? You've got six, Marco. So you've got 27 tables to serve and you've got six sauce boats. Nice. Did you order them? I only eggs with, um... Move that. Ten. Where's the chives? Tim, you're saying yes, but nothing's happening. Inspired by Marco's culinary journey, diners are arriving from every corner of the British Isles to sample his dishes. I'm expecting to eat a lot. Um, I'm expecting to have to adjust the belt on my jeans. And I love the fact that it's hunting and then serving the food, bringing it back to basics. And hey, with the way things are going, maybe we'll all have to be doing that soon. Well, I've known Marco since his first days at Harvey's. I followed his career through um, all his restaurants, and this is a very exciting event to see what he's up to with British food. I'm just very looking forward to it. But for one guest, Marco's menu will be a challenge. The last time I met meat was about 17 years ago. I must have been about seven or eight. After seeing Marco in action, Rachel Burke had a change of heart and is considering trying meat. I like his, his philosophy and the way he thinks about things in general. I think it's very admirable. 
With so much expected of him, Marco's keen to get his first dish, smoked eel, out on time. Nick, have you got the creamed horseradish? Yes, Marco. Where is it? Just here, Marco. Where? Just here, Marco. Yeah, but it's not in the sauce, the sauce boat. Yes, Marco. It is now two minutes to three, Nicholas. Yes, Marco. Can someone bring those sauce boats over, please? Those sauce boats. Sauce boats, please. Over here, please. Over here, please. Nick. Yes, Marco. The sauce boats have got no horseradish in yet. Yes, Marco. I didn't realise that he was serving horseradish. He didn't say, he didn't say that. Fucking chefs unbelievable, aren't they? After eight months discovering the very best British dishes, the big day has finally arrived for Marco Pierre White to serve them at his great British feast. Get more plates out, more plates out, please, Tim. There's no small job when you're doing this number of people. Now, obviously, the, uh, the feast starts, so this is where we've got to show what we can do now. The first course will, will be the first lesson and how the whole day is going to go, so I'm looking forward to it. It's good. OK, everybody's seated. And we, we've got to go after this. With over 200 expectant members of the public seated and ready to eat, all that's left is for Marco and Maitre D. Nick Mounier to serve the first course. Okay. When are you taking the food? Yeah, we're going now. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah they're the two tens, the first two of the tens. Okay, please, let's go, please. First up, Marco serving his appetizer of smoked eel with a potato salad, served with a horseradish sauce. It tastes really fresh. It's not chewy, it just melts in your mouth. Perfectly seasoned, and it's heavenly, really. I think you always imagine jelly deals. You've got to suck it off the bone and all that. And it always turns my stomach. But this is lovely. It's firm, smoky, excellent. Nick, no, I didn't say go with it. Bring it back. Go, go. Eight, let's go, please. Let's go. Take it, take it. Nick. Yes, Margot. How are you doing? Nothing, Margot. Everything's fine. But as the diners tuck in, there's a problem. Nick's miscalculated the number of boats needed to serve the horseradish sauce, leaving some people short. Nick, are you giving them creamed horseradish? Yes, Marco. So far, so good. Get the horseradish at the same time as the. Um... I didn't get no, I know. I love it. Yeah, no, we got it afterwards. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Did we get your horseradish cream? Oh, that's fine, that's fine, it's all part of the, you know, it's normal. So, exactly, all part of the experience. <laughs> I think we've sunk Nick, don't you? It's like the Titanic. They're sinking slowly with lots of casualties. Yes. Did you get your horseradish cream? No, we have no horseradish. It's my fault. That's <laughs> my fault. How's he going, Nicholas? Apart from my, um, mistake on the horseradish cream, Marco. Did you tell them to order you 27 sauce boats? I didn't know we were serving horseradish cream on the side, Marco. Did it say on the menu? It says horseradish cream, Marco, yes. Yeah. So what do you think we're going to do, self-service? I, I apologise, Marco. Don't apologise to me, there's 220 of them waiting. There's 220. Fuck, dude, I took my pants down. Oh. Do you, you're on camera, Sorry. Nicholas. Is that necessary? Have you cleared? Have you got your plates down? Come on, Nicholas. Despite Nick's small mistake, the smoke deal has wet the diner's appetite. Tim, get the tartare out, please. And Marco's keen to dish up the starter of raw venison tartare, served with Melba toast, as quickly as possible. Nick, how many waiters have you got ready for me? I have 27, Marco. Service, please. Don't be afraid. Let's walk up. For 24-year-old vegetarian Rachel Burke, this is the moment she's been anticipating. Inspired by Marco's journey, she's considering eating meat for the first time in 16 years. I'm really nervous now, to be honest. The thing is, I really want to do it, and I know if I don't, I'll kick myself when I get home. But I'm just feeling a bit apprehensive at the moment. The flavour's very um, intense. Um... There's a sort of almost pickled flavour to it, but lots of other flavours. So it's really tasty. 
tastes gherkin, I think. Gherkin is in it. It's very nice, actually. I never thought that I'd eat raw meat, but I've enjoyed, I'm enjoying this. <laughs> well, I was worried it would taste really raw, but it doesn't. It's not what I would. It's not bloody, or it doesn't taste like it needs cooking. It's really. It's quite nice. It's fresh, and I'd definitely eat that again and finish it off. Hopefully, <laughs> it's like livery taste of the deer and the sweetness of the wine and the sharpness of the capers. It was beautifully executed, so congratulations to the kitchen. A true British dish. Can have the fish pies then, Tim, please? Let's go with them, because we want to go home. With the appetizer and starter served, it's time for Marco to finish prepping his next dish. Nick, come on. But as his main course of fish pie cools, for Nick, the temperature's still rising. OK, no talking, please. Let's crack on with the service, please. Let's go. Who's next? Go, serve, serve. Serve, please, serve. Oh, no, we're on camera with my eyes, like, <laughs> popping out of my head. <laughs> Absolutely superb. The, the creaminess of the sauce and the, um, the individual large chunks of the fish have got a distinct sweet taste, and the fresh garden peas just go well with it which, of course, we only get in England. Oh, it is chunky. It's nice. I would have appreciated my prawns. I, would have, I haven't got any prawns or any scallops, but... I'll, no. have one, I'll have one prawn. I think the fish pie is nice. I feel that perhaps if it had been portioned individually, we all, all would have had some prawns and scallops. A bit of meat, a slab of meat would have been... would have seemed more appropriate for a feast. In a word, magnificent. Absolutely stupendous. <laughs> you know, best of everything that is British. We're an island. Um, we ought to be eating more fish out of the sea. It's great. Fabulous. It's pièce de résistance, even though he's not cooking French anymore. Whilst the fish pie of scallops, salmon, turbot and langoustine is proving a pleasure for the guests, in the kitchen, Nick's day is going from bad to worse. <laughs> I quit, I quit, I quit. You've got fish pie all over three of your suit. It's a good job they're not paying, Nick. Oh, for fuck's sake. Fuck it. Nicholas, people are waiting. Yes, Michael. I think you should serve that one yourself, Nick. Make an appearance. You got your peas? Remember, it's very hard for Nick. He's working with 38 people, or however many people, who he's never worked with before. So it's difficult, it's tough. Oh, that's heavy. Oh, I'll do with the rest. Are you enjoying it? Lovely, thank you. The essence is to keep smiling, because people are here for a good time. As you can see, the atmosphere is just electric. So little minor details, little mistakes, doesn't really matter. Plus, they're not paying for it, so you can get away with murder, can you? Results, licked by plate clean, practically. It was delicious. Uh, very, very posh fish pie. I mean, with scallops and whatever. I mean, it's not what I normally cook at home, but, I mean, it's really nice. Perfect. Taking a spoon of jelly and a bit of fruit and some syrup. Does that make sense? Yes. With the guests' plates cleared, Marco serves his three chosen puddings, Cambridge burnt cream, oh, wow. Eton mess and red jelly with summer fruits. And as a final treat for the diners... Two more waiters, please. ..he's serving them all at once. Service, come on. How many more to go, Tim? Who do you think makes the best eaten mess? Me or Marco? Right, um, well, I have to say that Marco comes a very close second to my wife, because I have to live with my wife and I don't have to live with Marco. The British food is all about stories, and you've all got stories from when you're a little girl, little childhood stories and things you love. So jelly and ice cream with lots of nice berries and a little bit of alcohol in it. It's a perfect version for adulthood. That's what I say. We love you, Marco. As the guests slowly polish off the puddings, Marco's journey is almost at an end. So you take everything into consideration, working with a lot of staff you don't know, an environment you've never worked in before, 
We fed everyone within time, you know. And I believe they've had a good meal with what I've heard come back. But one question remains. Has Marco succeeded in creating a great British feast? The feast that we've sort of all enjoyed today could have quite easily been based around simple products such as chicken, beef. But what Marco's done is he's gone out and he's researched and he's delivered perfect sort of alternatives to British menu. And I think that he's excelled himself in delivering something that's out of the ordinary but is tr traditionally British, yes. He's broadened people's horizons, I think, to, to look at what we've got within our shores and to make most of our own natural goodness. I think it would have been really easy to go with a nice piece of steak or a nice piece of lobster, all these sort of traditional sort of British food. But he's taken a step back from that almost and he's just chosen great ingredients and really good choices. Yeah. Yeah, we should bang a drum more about the, the indigenous dishes that we've got here, about the great ingredients that we've got. So, and it's nice to see somebody like Marco, who's made a career out of cooking French food his whole life and launching Italian restaurant chains, to actually, you know, you know, he's a guy from Leeds, you know, it's, it's nice to actually have him cooking something that's British for the first time. I'm going home. Done. The great British feast is over for me. Throughout his career, Marco has been reluctant to leave the kitchen and reveal himself to his diners. But as their comments filter through, he's decided to make a rare appearance. I'm in that melancholic state of mind, you know, leaving, walking through the hall when all the diners have been fed and they applaud you and they say thank you, and it is very moving. When you come to the end of a journey, there's always an element of sadness. And I've got to say, I'm glad it's over. But there's a side of me which is sad that it's over, because it's been a very special journey, and without doubt, one of the most special journeys of my life. Take me back to London, Mr. Shee, please. Yes. 